because we were speaking to lots of SaaS founders and one of the, the biggest challenge they were finding is that they felt that they were alone. Like, you know, and so how do we solve that? Let's bring them together, right, with this, uh, uh, with, with this support group. It's our job to tell better stories. And always remember, it's the risk takers that are rewarded. People are sick and tired of being marketed to, and they're sick and tired of being sold. The single biggest story today in sales and marketing is how our customers are buying different Hi, Alex, and welcome to the show. Hey, great to be here. Great to be back. In fact, it's been many years, but um, uh, uh, great to return uh, to the podcast. So thanks for having me. No worries. Uh, can you uh, kind of, we can start by kind of introducing and kind of getting f- familiar. So can you please tell a bit about yourself and what's your story? Yeah, what's my story? Uh, yeah, <laughs> good question. Um, I'm the founder and CEO of SaaStock. Uh, SaaStock is, uh, I guess, more than just a conference. I mean, we, we run the biggest SaaS conference in Europe, and uh, the, the next one's coming up on the 16th to the 18th of October in, in Dublin. Uh, last year, we had about 4,000 attendees. This year, it's going to be bigger uh, uh, than that. Uh, a very international uh, uh, event. Uh, actually, since the first ever SaaStock, we had... Um, 700 attendees from 34 different countries, including, you know, India, Australia, uh, Brazil come. And I, I was like, crazy. People are like flying over from Australia to Dublin uh, for this event. I thought it was like a European event. But uh, it kind of showed that people are building SaaS from anywhere. And then if if a, a valuable event is happening where people can get together with their peers and learn from those that are a few steps ahead, People will travel like, you know, 13,000 kilometers or more or whatever, right, for for that. So that was kind of like great to see. And we, we've obviously built SaaS up uh, from there, um, you know, on top of the conferences. And we do Dublin and we now do Austin in, in, in USA. Uh, we run a membership sort of offering for SaaS founders, helping them scale to 10 million in, in revenue. It's like a support network for founders getting together, mastermind groups, retreats, which I love, like going to the Amalfi Coast and Mykonos and stuff like that, a lot of fun. But but again, like all we do is like pick, you know, a location and just invite people to come. And then because they're peers, they start talking and they learn from each other and the magic happens, right? So we do that. Yeah. And we also do a bit of content as well. I've been running a podcast for eight years uh, also. Yeah, excellent. Uh, so what actually inspired you to, to do that, kind of start building community and what was your initial vision? For it. Yeah, 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 it's a good question. Do you know what? Like uh, initially, there wasn't a vision, um, and <laughs> I, I, I kind of fell, I fell, I fell into it. Um, uh, and it, it's one of these things that, like, through my twenties, or maybe all my life, I've been entrepreneurial. But in terms of, I, I guess, early days, you know, all the cliches of lemonade stands and you, you know, doing all these jobs, and paper rounds, and wanting to earn money. Uh, when I was uh, fifteen. I really wanted to work in McDonald's, right? Because I knew that I, I think just before I was 15, they would like employ me, or maybe it was when I was 16. Uh, but I was like, my sister works in McDonald's. I want to work in McDonald's. I want to earn money and be paid £3.90 an hour and work 12 hours a day and flip burgers and come home covered in grease. Um, and, you, you know, I, I just wanted to earn money, right? And um, I did that. And I worked in McDonald's for two years. So, uh, um, and uh, and I actually put on loads of weight as well, like surprisingly, because <laughs> I had McDonald's for breakfast, lunch, and dinner, uh, and I don't advise that. Uh, so I, I, before Super Size Me came out, I, I actually lived that uh, uh, as well. But I, I then went into my 20s, and I had all these crazy ideas for all these businesses, um, and actually I didn't have any drive to act on any of that. I was like, this is a great idea for a business. There's no frozen yogurt uh, uh, shops you know, in the U.K., they're in the US. Why don't I create one? Oh, I can't create one because I haven't got any money. You know, that was always my kind of barrier. So like I don't have any money. But I actually didn't have the the drive or the initiative then to actually overcome that barrier and just figure out how can you take an idea to reality if you've got a constraint of not having any money. So what, what I ended up doing, and, and it wasn't a waste, but I had, I had 11 years of selling other people's software. So 11 years as, uh, as an exec salesperson. Um, and then I, I sort of turned 30 and I was like, shit, getting old. I mean, 30 is not old now. Now I'm like, 30 is really young. Uh, and uh, I, I just kind of thought, oh shit, like, you know, am I ever going to build my own business? 
uh, now I'm 30, what am I going to do? Or, or am I going to be 50 years old wearing a suit and tie and selling software, you know, for, for other people? So I wasn't sure. I, I just thought, okay, I'll just, let's do stuff to kind of like push myself outside of my comfort zone. I started writing a blog, uh, actually found out that I was like not a great writer uh, and I didn't know that the blog was about SaaS, right? And I was like, well, I've never run a SaaS business. So this is obviously not the best idea in the world. But what I did was recognize my sort of weakness and kind of like flip my position into like an editor. And I reached out to lots of great people who were uh, experts in customer success and sales and growing SaaS businesses. And I said, hey, would you like to write for uh, a blog? And I won't pay you anything, uh, but you create an original content for, for me, but it's not really for me. It's for the community and for SaaS founders to how to grow their business. Uh, and lo and behold, like almost everybody said yes uh, uh, to that. So then I was like churning out, pushing out content on a regular basis uh, and then started a podcast to supplement that. And then I started doing some SaaS meetups sort of locally uh, and I had a newsletter and then the people, there was like all of a sudden there was an audience that I'd built there and I hadn't sort of realized what I was doing. And the audience said to me, why don't you build a conference? Because we'd love to for people to come together. And I was like, oh, I'm looking for a way to bring this together, to make this full time because I, I'm really enjoying doing this. Uh, and, and that was kind of like the origins of like how SaaS Doc started. So I kind of like there wasn't a grand plan that I'm going to be, you know, going to the conference business or create a massive community it, it just kind of happened, right? So, uh, which was, yeah, good. And then I say, no, the rest was history. A lot of hard work over the last eight years. But, uh, um, that, but yeah, that it worked is, out. Thank God. That is so interesting and so inspiring to hear that. Um, what's, what's the time frame here? Like when you started and kind of figured out, oh, I'm going to do this. Or yeah, kind of uh, organic but you know what? It was, so when I started, I think it was probably February 2015. Mm-hmm. Um, that was kind of like when I started the, the blog uh, I can't remember, maybe the first post was like in March of 2015. Uh, and then the first conference was September 2016. So that gives you a kind of time. So quite quite quick in terms of like yeah. building the audience. I, I would say actually within three months of uh, launching the blog, we were getting like 30,000 visitors a month uh, to, to the blog. That's so it, And what, what was good, so we kind of like, the timing was quite good. And I, I think what worked sort of really well was actually there was less competition back then. Now, how like there's so many SaaS blogs out there at the moment, so many SaaS podcasts. We're on one at the moment. Uh, it's a marketing SaaS podcast. Um, but you, you, you know, back then there just wasn't a lot, right? So um, that was that kind of helped. So I don't think the quality was, in some cases, you know, particularly high or world class, right? There's much better content kind of out there. But um, yeah, it just kind of like. The timing was was good for that. Um, and then, yeah, on the conference side of things, I started working on that in November 2015, for almost like almost a year. Uh, uh, you don't need to work a year like on one conference because then you overthink every single detail. It's like, oh, what should the beer mats look like? And you, this, so what color should the wristband be? And should it be this shade of orange and pink? And, you, you, you know, and so on, right? So spend a lot of time overthinking stuff. But, uh, but yeah, that's pretty much the uh, uh, the timelines, so getting the first event done. Um, so, yeah. Those are huge numbers. I'm like probably the... being too modest about the quality of the this yeah, original exactly. content. 30,000? Probably it was pretty good. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, probably. Um, like, no, obviously, look, I mean, we, we had ex- some ex- experts coming in and creating original content. And we were actually, there was a lot of volume as well. So I feel like, uh, and also I was writing content. Uh, again, I, I like... Um, a lot of it was kind of almost like fun SaaS content. It was a bit weird. I was just doing like school of SaaS listicles, like, you know, who are the top, you know, professors of SaaS and stuff like that. Uh, and and they, they seem to kind of like work as well as the kind of the more kind of serious stuff. But we're probably pushing out maybe like three or four pieces a week um, and then doing a couple of newsletters a week. And um, yeah, uh, so yeah, kind of uh, took up. Yes, a lot of work. That's the lesson from there. Mm. Um, but I have to ask, what makes community building, in your opinion, so important in the B2B SaaS space? Yeah, it's a, it's a good question, right? Because I think uh, if we will put it in maybe our context and then in, in general, right? There, there are a lot of SaaS conferences out there now, right? But uh, I don't think like all of them do community building, community SaaS building, 
Um, and perhaps they don't necessarily need to. I think in some cases, like uh, there, there, there are successful, um, you know, competitors of ours that, that don't have a community. But for us, uh, we came out of community, right? We came out of uh, having an audience. We came out of doing local meetups. And it was the, the community, it was the audience who told us they wanted SaaS stock. Uh, and for us, uh, you know, we learned from our audience and our community of like how to, what do they want? How can we solve their problems? How can we make things better uh, with SaaS stock? Um, and they're constantly the people that are like telling us, uh, you know, having the answers and, and helping us grow uh, the business. So that's kind of on one side, there's the advantage of being close to the customer uh, and uh, the customer telling you kind of what they want and you you, you kind of taking that data uh, and then using that, say, okay, well, here are the pain points of all these founders or like they're feeling particularly lonely. I mean, this is kind of like, if I fast forward to the last couple of years, why do we start the SaaS founder membership? Because we were speaking to lots of SaaS founders and one of the, the biggest challenge they were finding is that they felt that they were alone. Like, you know, and so how do we solve that? Let's bring them together, right, with this uh, uh, with, with this support group. Um, so so I think that's one thing. The, the customers, the community, there's a lot of data there to help with the business. And then I think, like, also it can be the moat, right? If you build a strong community, this can really be the moat for the business, right? So if SaaS stocks uh, has... Uh, a loyal fan base, um, super fans, you, you know, these super fans, they're going to be doing everything they can to promote SaaS stock, to attain the SaaS stock, and perhaps, you know, less so with, you, you know, our competitors, right? They're, they're kind of bought into us and our brand, right? Uh, additionally, like we have, a, a lo- lo- like I a, a, a previously mentioned, uh, we did local meetups before SaaS stock was a, a conference, uh, we continue to do those today, but through SaaS Uh We do some in uh, Helsinki. I think there's one actually next week. Um, and like pre-COVID, we had 30 SaaS locals around the world. Um, n- COVID obviously like uh, stopped like all, all, all of them, of course. Uh, and now we've kind of got it back to 17 SaaS locals, uh, and effectively it's current and future SaaS entrepreneurs getting together for a meetup, networking, a little bit of content, uh, and then taking it from there. Um, my point there is that if we've got a hundred SaaS stock locals around the world, that is a great moat, you, you know, uh, for us, a great sort of beachhead to kind of, you know, protect us from new entrants, uh, and so on, because that's really going to be hard to replicate, you, you know? So these are the things that we got to look at, like the, the value of community. Um, so I, I guess the value strategically, but the benefit of being part of the community, right, is... Look, you, you know, we, we're putting together, we're getting together great people. Uh, that's the, 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 the main essence of it, getting people together that are like you or a few steps ahead of you. And you get to learn from that, right? And uh, and you feel less alone uh, and, and so on, right? So there's a, a lot of value. But um, yeah, I would say those are the main things. It's actually the best way of learning, I think, to talk and kind of meet people. So uh, when you talk about meet meetups, are they physical meetups or are they online Yes. They are physical. Um, yeah, so SAS not local. It, it's all all physical. Uh, generally, between fifty to hundred people get together in the the, the different locations and uh, meet up in various SAS companies uh, offices and uh, event spaces. Uh, we don't go to all, all all of these. So often they're the people that kind of uh, run it locally that are you know community builders, SAS entrepreneurs. You, you know people that want to get just local communities together and we provide them the kind of, you know, the, the infrastructure to, to, to kind of do that. And obviously the SAS dot brand to kind of help pull things together in our network. Um, uh, obviously the conferences are in-person gatherings. We did two years of nothing but virtual during COVID. And I was really excited about the virtual stuff, you know, kind of initially, but everybody then got fatigue, virtual fatigue, uh, webinar fatigue and Zoom fatigue. And yeah, it seems unfortunately that, you know, virtual events are really, I don't know, like kind of died a death, uh, which is a shame because I thought it was a good bit of innovation that the events industry needed. Um, but you, you can see a lot of the, uh, the, the the big tech companies and the platforms that were powering the virtual uh, events uh, space are, are kind of no longer with us, right? Um, but yeah, like when we came back to in-person, we did the first in-person event was SaaS.LocalLondon. 
and 120 people signed up and about eight, 90 people came and everybody just had the biggest grin on their face. It's like another human, another SaaS founder. I've been locked up for two years. And like, it, it was just a really nice, like, hey, we're back together in person after two really difficult years. Um, and after two years of virtual conferences, and um, yeah, just like everybody was just so happy to be back together, right? So, so yeah, I, I, I love that feeling. And again, like in, in Dublin, we're going to have thousands of people there, and they, there's just a vibe and energy. Dublin brings part of that vibe and energy, but the people bring it as well because they're excited to come to Dublin, and they just come there with like you know a pay it forward mindset and just like you, you know lead with help that sort of thing. And there's, there, there is that kind of special buzz, I would say, at Sasstock. So I have to ask, because, I mean, this is something I wanted to ask a bit later in the conversation, but you brought uh, COVID. Um, and I mean, now things are kind of coming back to normal, uh, just like knocking on wood here. Um, but and you mentioned that, you know, people are excited to also attend in-person events again. Um, but is that like, like, do you think that in, now and in the future, there will be, you know, more people attending in-person events or is the online a real competitor, uh, like, you know, for similar events and for your community as well? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I don't think online is a real competitor. Um, I think people are just really just happy to be together in person. There's so much more you can achieve in person than o online. I do think, like, and I say, yeah, I think it is a shame that online virtual events seem to have died a death and, like, nobody like maybe one one in the SaaS space is kind of doing on, online uh virtual events but i don't think like any others like slush is not doing virtual conferences you know web summit not doing virtual conferences anymore they just focus on their getting people together um and yeah like i said i've just returned to you know from how to web in romania i met 10 people there that i wouldn't have met had i not been there and uh, that can really add value that can make introductions for me that could lead to something that really kind of moves the dial and had I just stayed at home you know behind my desk which I spend most of my time like you know behind my desk like this would not have happened and that, like I would have made some incremental um, you, you know movement on the business but not really the dial movers is like you, you know something like knowing uh, like an instance that um, I was at this the, the, the conference I was at how to where uh, I probably posted something on LinkedIn. Somebody I knew, they tagged somebody else that, oh, this person is, a, uh, is also at the conference. And I didn't know that they were there because I hadn't been looking on the, the networking app, which is where I finished company. Uh, and um, I then reached out to the person and then we connected and then it was a really great meeting, right? So it, 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 it just probably wouldn't have happened, you know, had I not been there in person. And so that's in a, in a way a little bit of like engineered serendipity and there's no serendipity in online conferences, right? Uh, you only get that, you know, in person and when you're in Dublin at Sastock, you're getting into the hotel lift and somebody gets in the lift and it's an investor that might invest in your company or, you, you know, it's somebody, you, you know, a great SaaS founder that you, you know, strike up a connection with and have breakfast with or you see them, you know, kind of running in the park and go jogging with them or something like that, right? You can't replicate that. Uh, so, I, the, I, yeah, I, I just, I, I don't think online is coming back like anytime soon. Mm -hmm. So your advice would be that just go out and about and... It, it, exactly. Mm -hmm. I, I think like also probably like a little bit with COVID. I know like after COVID and every, like the world opened up, certainly in, in my case, there was a bit of this... Um, what do they call like revenge travel, uh, you, you know, where everybody was like, oh, I just want to get on as many flights as possible because I can, right? And I, I sort of did that. I, I sort of went back to almost like the same amount of travel as I did pre-COVID, which I said I would never do. And now that's kind of like calmed down. But I think also a lot of people kind of really got used to remote work and really got used to, hey, I can be productive like at home and I can get stuff done. But then maybe it's just going to look like, oh, I don't want to go to this big conference with thousands of people and probably a few germs and stuff like that, right? But uh, I think there's, I, I do think and I do see that there's a number of people that just don't get out uh, like anymore. Um, and uh, I think that's a missed trick because with that example, like I mentioned, a how-to web, had I not gone, had I not taken that leap of faith, oh, like I'm going to be two days in Romania and, I'm, I'm not going to be as productive and get all my to-do lists done. Um, 
but actually like, I'm going to make connections that I wouldn't have made had I not gone there that are really going to be valuable. So you know, it's the kind of the trade-off and I think it's a really good one. Cool. Um, so in addition to meetups and personal face-to-face events, uh, can you share a couple of tactics for um, identifying and connecting with your target audience if you're attempting to start a online community? I'm yeah. asking for a friend here. <laughs> yeah, okay, very, very good. Um, so the, I, I think that the first thing is like you're building a community and we make like uh, we've made mistakes and we we continue to make mistakes, but you you learn you learn from these, right? But I think what I've learned, let's say with the SaaS founder membership, uh, so like initially when we launched that, we, we thought, oh, this can be a membership for everybody in the SaaS community. So whether you're a founder, you're a VP of marketing, you're a CFO, you're an investor, like everybody, the doors are open, welcome, right? But then actually, what you find it's like it's confusing, and who is this for, and who's getting the value from it, and then you've got to really kind of uh, uh, to, to spread uh, an audience and like then the founders are not keen for the investors to be in there and, you know, so on and so forth. Uh, and, and, and what we learned was that, you know, when we kind of really focused and went narrow, it's like we just want this specific type of person and maybe there's fewer of them, but we're going to serve them well. Uh, you, you know, that was when we started to, in that light bulb moment and sort of aha like right? this this could actually kind of work right and, and did start to work so we focus on b2b SaaS founders that have revenue really our kind of sweet spot there is if they're over a million of revenue and want to scale to 10 million of revenue right so kind of focus uh on that uh and then a very difficult um i think like some of the challenges initially is like uh because the, the SaaS founder membership where we're selling a, a service here right um and we're saying hey look we're building a, a support group and network and we're going to put you in a mastermind group and we're going to give you a network and we're going to give you educational sessions and run events. We're selling that to that first person, right? When there's nobody else in there, right, is quite, you know, the challenge. It's like, oh, oh yeah, we're going to give you this network, et cetera, but you're going to be number one uh, and you're going to be alone. And then but we're going to bring in number two, number three and, uh, and so on. So people had to take a leap of faith. And that's where, I, I guess, maybe the first bit of um, uh, advice or uh, here or, or, or lesson is that because we got this SaaS stock brand and credibility and authority, you, you know, Cialdini's uh, influence, you, you know, whatever, seven principles of influence there, you, you know, there's credibility, authority behind SaaS stock. Uh, it makes it easier for somebody joining a community to take that leap of faith because there is this brand there that has this trust and authority and credibility. So, yeah, luckily I tied that into, you know, something marketing uh, uh, there. But, uh, but then, I, I, then I think the next thing is, right, um, and actually here's one great tip for you, uh, but, or not for you, but, you know, for your friend, uh, and, <laughs> um, is uh, there's a great book that's really helped us that we're still, like, working through the strategy. It's called Get Together. I, uh, I don't. I don't think it's behind me, but it's an orange book, um, and it's about like how to build a community, right? And it's got this framework, and I would just follow that framework, right? Uh, and um, uh, effectively, like you've got to empower the members uh, to to grow the community, right? And uh, that's something that we, you know, we're trying to do, and it's t- it's taking time. So obviously you've got to deliver value to them and you've got to get, you, you know, the basics right. You've got to have that specific ICP, that focus, you know, who is the community for, what do you do for them, you know, on a regular basis, you know, start, get them to start getting value. And it's like, okay, you know, this is working for me. And then you empower them to grow the community rather than you going out, putting adverts out there and doing cold outbound, like getting members selling the the community is the, the best growth tactic uh, there. So that's something that we're still working on, but is really trying to empower and supercharge our members and our, our leaders. Uh, well, that's the beauty of the community. It kind of starts working for you. Exactly. Like, like if you get it right, it becomes viral, yeah. right? It becomes viral. But how can you ensure that it gets it actually flows to the right direction? What happens if, if you see that... <gasps> Uh, how can you ensure? I mean, mm-hmm. I don't know if, if you can. I guess the, the best way to to do it, right, is, is just I think really just like pinpoint who your people are, get the right people there, 
Uh, and then if they are the right people, uh, they get bought into the why, right? Uh, and then they get the value of it and then they start spreading the why. Then people will, outside of the community, will look at, oh, look, you, you know, uh, John is a great founder. You know, he's running this business. Like, he's legit. Uh, I follow him on social media and he's saying, you know, join the SaaS founder membership and I'm curious and so on. You, you know, it, it kind of just like works like that. So I think if you get the right people, um, that, that's got to help. And then get them bought into the why, deliver value, you, you know, then, you know, I would say the rest should work itself out. It's not as easy as that. But um, I think these are some of the key ingredients. So what are the main challenges if you, if you think about communities and while building them? Yeah, the main challenges. I mean, like for us, the, the main challenge is really, I would say, being one of resource and, t- and time uh, internally. So I had the idea for the SaaS.com founder membership during COVID. Uh, so pre-COVID, SaaS.com was just really focused on content and on conferences. Um, all our revenue came from our conferences. Um, and then, and we were 24 people in the, in the company. Uh, and then in 2020, we went down to nine people. So we had to, uh, you know, say goodbye to a lot of good, uh, team members. Um, but that had to, had to happen to sustain the business because, you know, we lost two thirds of our revenue, uh, uh, during that time, uh, which I'm happy to say, you know, is now back and, uh, and, and bigger than it was sort of pre COVID. Um, but during that time is obviously like, okay, when I was speaking to founders and speaking to the community and then they, they were the ones like they had said, build the conference. They were the ones who said, this is, we need something like this because we're alone. So I built, uh, that from getting this customer feedback and, um, uh, doing that customer development work, I, I guess kind of, you know, inadvertently, uh, but then the challenge here, you know, tying it into the resources, right. Was, well, we're fighting to keep the company alive during COVID and we're doing virtual events and actually we're doing shitloads of them. I think we did 38 in one year, you know, including webinars and something like that. But that that paid the bills and we were doing that with a team of nine. And then I'm going to the team, oh, I've got this really good idea, you know, this the community side, like, can we can we start to build this? And I need some, you know, I need some money here and I need a bit of resource to do this, you know, this, that and the other. And... I, I think the common advice is like you, you know when you're you're going through a storm, right? Uh, you know, from a, in a business sense, right? You, you probably don't focus on your side projects, uh, which which they were at that time, right? Um, and uh, so we probably, from a timing perspective, should have done that. And I think that therefore we we didn't have we did launch the community, but we just didn't have a lot of time to give it that love and attention that it kind of needs. Uh, and I think only until like um, summer of 2022 did we then start to put like the appropriate resources on it. Um, and then still, uh, like we don't have anybody like dedicated to marketing on our, our community, but like arguably uh, uh, there could and it should be and hopefully for 2024 uh, that will come in in the plan. But right now, as we've come from a conference kind of, well, like community audience conference, but the conference sucks a lot of our resource and time and energy. As you can imagine, trying to get thousands of people to double it. Our marketing team are often very focused on that and getting the delegates to double it. And, uh, and therefore the, the, the SASA founder membership, like, you know, does suffer a little bit from that in terms of getting that, uh, that same, uh, I don't know, time uh, to, to spend on it as we do on events. So I'm pretty sure like if, if we had an equal amount of time on the founder membership from a marketing perspective as we do events, you know, we'd really kind of start to see that you're putting fuel on the fire and uh, it's starting to take off. So I, I, I think those are the kind of the constraints, right? It's like, it's almost like a, a startup within the startup, right? And if you're only focused on it 20% of the time, you know, how are you going to uh, get it to be the best that it can be, get it to deliver to the vision that you, you have? Um, and, you know, arguably these things could be full time. And now when I've seen communities like Pavilion, which used to be Revenue Collective, right, they're like the team and Sam Jacobs, you know, they're full time on that from the beginning. And they scaled that very fast by doing the right things. A lot of the things that are said in the get together book. 
Um, and um, they didn't have the distraction or the legacy of the the legacy business, the conference business kind of hanging over them. And even though the, it should be a bit of an advantage having this conference business to to market, you, you know, the, the memberships uh, and community into, yeah, there, there's still those challenges that, that, that we face. So. All right. Um, thank you for the comprehensive answer. That was pretty good. Mm-hmm. Um, but yeah, I have to ask, like, other than, you know, time, sweat and hard work, uh, is there like a a go-to platform or a set of tools that you can use to, you know, get a community off the ground. Community kit. <laughs> yeah, yeah, community kit. <laughs> well, do, do you know what? Actually, something I... Uh, a big mistake... I'll try to make this answer a little bit shorter, but a uh, big mistake we made the first time around is we thought it was all about the tech, right? And we focused... And actually, we, we had somebody, like, in charge of the project, and he was looking at all these different platforms and ended up going down this route with this specific app uh, and it was all about the tech and all the features of this app and creating all these different rooms. And like we, what, what I learned and through speaking with other people is the tech doesn't matter, right? Uh, it's about the why, it's about the people, you, you know, uh, and so on. And so like a very um, high level kind of like text, you do need something, you do need some sort of resources, but it can be as simple as Slack and WhatsApp, right? You know, for the online kind of elements, right? And uh I'm part of the entrepreneurs community and uh, they have a Slack group, they have a WhatsApp group, right? And actually I'm not active like in in, in either. And some are very active and some are not. Uh, and there is, you know, those different personas within communities. Uh, and for us, we've got a WhatsApp group. Uh, we don't have a Slack group, but I don't th- see the need to kind of like have both. We use a platform called Circle. It's kind of more like our resource hub and we do some, updates and stuff on there and it, it you know much more like you know not like asynchronous stuff but it's like we'll post updates here are the events that are happening and here's a directory of members uh, and so on and so forth but whatsapp is kind of where people like post questions and uh you know a bit, a bit kind of more real time and i think that's it really so if you're starting a community like the tech is not the main thing uh at all it's kind of lower down but you do need something so, so if the tech is not not the number one thing, but um, how do you measure your success and kind of uh, the impact on an online or community itself, and what indicators yeah. should we follow? We 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 do a simple thing, quarterly NPS survey, and the results used to be not great, you know, from my standards, right? Um, and now I think the last one went out, and we're like, oh, maybe it's changed since we last looked, but it was plus one hundred. The, the 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 last time I looked, which was like a few days ago, and, and we've got that from like zero, you know, uh, NPS to like a ten to twenty to thir- having the target at thirty, and now the targets are like, well, now we've got north of seventy. Let's kind of keep it up there, and and that's it. And then when you've got that, right? Obviously, as we we know, and I'm sure you listeners know, like north of uh, plus forty as well passed and it means you've got something and it means that this can grow you know through hopefully word of mouth um and 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 that's how we measure right and we we see that sort of customer satisfaction and we can see that we've got these um you know members that are really passionate about what we do uh and that has not happened overnight right that has been a two-year process uh sure but mbs is how how we measure like we, we 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 were looking at and we, we do look a bit, little bit like engagement metrics, so like on the online platforms. But like I say, the like members get a lot of value outside of, you, you know, did they post on WhatsApp, you know, this week or, or whatever, right? Some people don't, right? And um, still get value, but they get value from their mastermind groups or they get value from a workshop that they attended. Or maybe they, some of them just get value from our annual retreats. And that's their main reason that they're there, right? And they get that opportunity to go to Mykonos or Morocco or whatever and hang out with like 40 great people and once a year away from their family and, you know, talk business and uh, and, and that's enough for them, right? And that, that will enable them to say, oh, you know, I fucking love this community. Here's a plus 100 uh, or, he, you know, I'll give it a 10, you know, uh, rating. Um, and, um, yeah, I, I think that's it. So we just focus on NPS right now. Okay, so, I mean, you just mentioned NPS and, um, you know, like, the, the value that uh, the, the members get from the community. But since we're talking about measuring, what were the main milestones that, you know, 
your community reached over the years? Good, uh, good question. So it, it, it's still growing, uh, uh, like for us. Um, you, you know, I think the, the main milestones we, we look at in terms of founder circles, which are, are, are like mastermind groups um, that we're running. So there's generally like six, seven uh, people per mastermind groups. We're running about sort of like 10 of those at the moment. Um, we're under 100 members, uh, but if you think about it, they're um, all CEOs of SaaS companies. Uh, the, the the ticket price or, or, or the price to join the membership is either 2,000 euros or 3,000 euros. So it's not super expensive, I mean, depending on uh, who you're speaking to. But for a founder, CEO, um, uh, de definitely uh, there, there are uh, you know higher alternatives out there uh, on the market. Um, uh, and yeah, we're at like, you know, uh, a couple of hundred thousand sort of ARR um, on that. And uh, obviously we're looking to get that, you know, into the millions, uh, which I'm sure will, will happen within the next couple of years. Uh, talking about the events, um, can you maybe share a couple of success stories on, uh, on the impact of, of the events uh, for the community? Yeah, uh, I, I, I guess can um, a couple of stories. Like, I mean, like I think the was it the first SaaS stock or maybe the second SaaS stock. Uh, there's a CEO of a company called Actito, a Belgian company, uh, Benoit Denea, and uh, I just remember like his post event feedback was that he'd learned more in two days than he had of like one year. You, you know, kind of like ru running his business uh, at SaaS stock, right? And I thought that I mean, clearly it's a uh, an impactful quote that I still remember you know, from like 2016 or 2017. Um, we've seen a lot of companies get funded at SaaS stock. Uh, so there was a company called Glowfox, uh, which recently got acquired by an American company. It's like a SaaS for gyms, like a, uh, and um, they got acquired for 200 million, but they raised their, I want to say seed round uh, at SaaS stock. They met their investors there. Uh, even later stage, um, so in 2019, I got introduced to this guy. I was like, who's this guy? Um, oh, like, nice to meet you, Andre. Uh, you know, no idea what you do. Oh, Miro. Yeah, never heard of you. Um, and uh, <laughs> yeah, but, but thanks for coming to SaaS stock anyway. And, <laughs> and um, he actually raised his Series C. Uh, at, he met his investor, which was Iconic Growth, at SaaS stock. Uh, and they ended up doing a Series C. It was like 60, 80 million. And then I think, you know, uh, in, sense, uh, uh, in terms of the company, Miro is now like, I don't know, valued in the billions. And it's probably, I think he's doing like 500 million in revenue or something like that. And I was just like, I got introduced to him by Goddard Abel from G2. And I was like, oh, yeah, hi, nice to meet you, whatever. <laughs> uh, uh, I was like, you know, I was a bit nicer than that. But, um, but some, sometimes I, I only get to meet people very quickly. And it's like, Andre, nice to meet you, Miro. Thanks for coming. Okay, I'm off. Um, but um, since then, I've met him a few more times. And uh, he's, uh, he's a good guy. And he shared, I didn't actually know until last year that he, he met his investors for a Series C at SaaS stock. And that's kind of what he was doing there. So uh, it was pretty cool. That is cool. Very cool story. Um, about future of SaaS stock. And yeah. kind of ad advice for aspiring community builders. Um, how do you see the event will continue to support the SaaS community? Yeah, yeah. I like, I mean, for, for, I can see SaaS being there in another 10 years' time. You know, the Dublin event growing and growing. I don't know how big it's going to be, like, uh, you, you know, at, at, at that point. Um, but, like, I never say never, but, uh, you know, do we want it to be a 20, 30,000 conference? Like, probably not today. I'd rather keep the the high quality than sort of like dilute it like some other, you, you know, kind of mammoth conferences. Um, uh, so everybody there, you, you know, has a real SaaS company, is a, you, you know, uh, a founder, a CEO, a C-level or a VP really, you know, at SaaS stock. Um, so we don't want to dilute that sort of too much. But then obviously the USA conference, scaling that up as well. So we have two big conferences on, you know, either side of the, uh, the Atlantic and likely – uh, you know, quite likely, certainly for you know the ten year horizon, that you know will be in Asia and, and maybe Latin America uh, as well. Um, so I think that's the one hand. The SaaS founder membership, you, you know, certainly, hopefully by that point we'll have a thousand members, uh, a thousand founders, and that will be helping getting to ten million in revenue. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I would say kind of like these are the main things that we're kind of 
making a difference like every day to you know every member every founder in our community and their companies and their teams and that's kind of what gets us you know out of bed right and uh, uh, every morning and ready to go and you know keep making that impact and uh, feel I, I feel blessed in a way to have found you know a business and a, and a job that that actually does that because I know not not every uh, body has that not every company kind of has such an impact and opportunity to have an impact as, as we do um so yeah i like very very blessed that we've uh, we've done that and we'll continue you know for the long run so alex uh, are you living the dream am i living the dream uh yeah i guess all of that they say uh what is it if you if, if you find a job that you love you never have to work uh, a day for the rest of your life right So that's kind of what it feels like. Uh, there are, of course, like being a founder of a company, a lot, a lot of stressful days where, like, <laughs> you know, uh, but I, I, I take, take it away because obviously that will ruin the quote. Um, uh, in, in general, it's like I don't have any anxiety about working on Monday, right? Because I'm actually looking forward to work and my colleagues and the challenges and the opportunities like with that. And I think it's great and I get to travel like, a lot i get to meet so many great people uh a, a, a great sort of uh plus positive or whatever of what what i do and building community is that you get to meet so many amazing people and surround yourself by so many amazing people that can you know lift you up uh, a level and um you know so entrepreneurs you, you know so sort of hanging out with entrepreneurs and not necessarily that this is uh, always kind of like the the, the the measurement but like you know oh all these founders have sold their businesses for 200 million or they're running 100 billion businesses and here's little old me with them and like you, you know you feel a bit of an imposter but but actually they're just humans like you that have you, you know have, have obviously done great things there isn't that much of a difference apart from obviously what they've done versus what what you're doing and then you can learn from them and they're all, all pretty cool people I haven't met many dicks you know over my my time just a few when I won't name them But if you, if, you want, if you want me to type them in the chat, I will. I won't. I'm joking. They uh, recognize themselves well, if they're listening yeah, to yeah. three notes. Don't put it in the show notes. But um, yeah, like uh, I just met so many great people over the last eight years, and like, over the next eight years, I'm going to meet so many more great people. And uh, yeah, that's uh, pretty exciting. And at this point, I actually want to bring up that you also have your own podcast. Hey. Do you want to give a blooper of that about that? Yeah, yeah. So, no blue, yeah, good, good question. So, uh, I run the SaaS Revolution Show podcast. Uh, arguably, potentially, the first ever SaaS podcast. Uh, so, it started in 2015. Um, and so, it was just kind of like after, I don't know if, if, if the listeners and you guys kind of remember a podcast called Serial, just kind of that, that was really kind of what uh, I think helped podcasts come back into, um, you, you know, the spotlight. Uh, and then I thought about doing a podcast to supplement the blog and the, uh, you know, the meetups that I was doing. And uh, I'm still doing it eight years later. Every week it goes out. Uh, interview mostly SaaS founders, but occasionally not SaaS founders, like investors or people that are kind of relative or, you know, operators, marketers, etc. But it's just a show about like how have you built your business? How have you grown your build business? What are the lessons learned uh, there, etc.? keeping it simple and um, yeah so if you want to learn how to grow a SaaS business and get it to 10 million in revenue plus then give the SaaS revolution show a listen brilliant all, all right. right maybe we'll uh, move on then yeah well we actually reached the end of our chat now but uh, yeah before we let you go we have to go through the fast five segments. I don't want to go I want to stay actually <laughs> we'd <laughs> okay. love to have you That here forever <laughs> uh, no but yeah we have five questions and we just need five short answers are you ready okay. Try, try. <laughs> no worries. Well, any book you'd like to recommend to you know anyone watching or listening to us today? Yeah, well, I think uh, give this a marketing podcast. I uh, think like marketing books, and I'm sure that there are many. Um, and one of it's like I've been following this guy Alex Famosi uh, uh, a bit. I don't know if you know him, but he wrote this book called The Hundred Million Dollar Offer, and it was a pretty good uh, book about how to kind of create these compelling offers and structure it on email, etc was a good one and another if uh, I know you said short answer but um, uh, Ogilvy, Ogilvy on advertising which is actually behind me um, you can see it there if you've got a good eye um, 
that's a good book. And the reason I raised that, because obviously it really kind of helps around copywriting, which I I see is a real just issue in uh, in general in marketing, that there's not that many great copywriters out there, not that many good emails going out or social media kind of going out. And people could do well by learning the traits of copywriting uh, better. Um, so, yeah. All right. A SaaS company you love and why? Oh, it's a tricky one. Um, SaaS company I love. Like, I'm going to go for, uh, again, two. I know you asked for one, but I, I think, like, I live in Slack. Uh, you, you know, uh, obviously, I know it's kind of part of Salesforce, but uh, for us, great collaboration tool. Um, I, I actually wanted to hire my first person at SaaStock just so I could use Slack because obviously I couldn't use it on my own and send myself <laughs> messages. Um, but, so, so that, this is true. This is a true story. Uh, I love that. <laughs> yeah. And um, and then I think it's like now uh, I, I, this, I watch a company called Coralie. Um, they are, so you've probably heard of like uh, Price Intelligent and Profit Well, um, Patrick Campbell um, is sort of well known in the, in the SaaS space. And uh, Coralie are kind of building um, the SaaS version, and that's probably more that of like price intelligently, but effectively uh, enabling any SaaS and subscription company uh, to really understand what pricing that, uh, they should offer um, using AI. And so it's like a monetization platform, and uh, I think that's going to be really interesting and powerful. So I watch out for them. All right. This one is, you might have a biased answer here, but what is your favorite platform to read about growth? Favorite platform to read about growth? I would, I would say uh, SaaS doc, uh here. Um, it is a good question. Do you know what? Like, I, I gonna, I gonna switch it to say it's not really like an online platform. It's not really a particular blog. I learn and read read about growth from from books. You know, traditional right. books. Good answer. Um, what is the most important growth metric? Uh, it's good. In SaaS, I think, you know, everybody's just speaking about NRR, net retention revenue uh, these days and having that over 100%. And ideally, like, you know, 120. Um, you, you know, I ask the questions to the VCs on my panel, uh, how to web and it's like NRR. I ask everybody, it's like NRR is the kind of the real metric that it, People are looking at uh, uh, what is it and uh, uh, making sure that's a good one. So I'll go with that. All right. And finally, what is your best piece of advice for fellow marketers? So I think it goes along with that. The what we talked about with the copywriting and the, the fact that there's so much bad copywriting out there. Um, and I, I try to improve. And there's more that we can do, like within SaaS stock ourselves, right? So we're, we're far far from perfect. Um, there is a there's a blog post from a guy called Matt Lerner about uh, what he specifically calls a founder language fit, right? And it, it, it's it's really good post. People should look it up. But like for us, where we you know we sell to founders, it's about uh, creating copy and kind of getting into the mindset of the founder. So when they receive your email, that you're feeling their pain, you understand them. You know you you're in that sort of mindset. Um, and uh, I think that's really valuable. So whether you're selling to marketers and understand their pain and understand their mindset or sales professionals or whatever, so it could be sales leader language fit or marketing leader language fit or whatever. But uh, I think if people could read that post and just understand that like the people that you're marketing to or selling to, you really kind of want to get into their heads, right? And I think not a lot, a lot of companies kind of do that. So we probably all get so <clears throat> so many emails and LinkedIn messages. And the ones that you kind of click on or respond to, the ones that you're like, oh, I'm thinking about that. How did they know, right? They got into your head, right? And they, they've done it very well, right? And sometimes it's a bit of luck because you're feeling that pain and they come with that offer, right? That, of course. But when it, they kind of craft it and uh, in, in that right way, uh, those are the ones that I respond to. And the rest just ignore, delete in the bin. Perfect answer. And if you don't know how to do that by yourself, you can always contact your nearest agency. Safety, <laughs> at what we to be. Well done. Might well be. done. <laughs> yeah. Well, I guess yeah. That's it. That's Thank it. you so much, Alex, for joining. Uh, having you on the show was absolute pleasure. 
Kiitos, kiitos paljon. Wow, in Finnish as well. Kiitos, Alex. Yeah. It was a pleasure. And uh, we do welcome you back in a couple of years' time again. <laughs> and that's a wrap. I hope you found this insightful. To get more from us, you can follow and subscribe to the SaaS Growth Hub podcast on SoundCloud, Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or right here on YouTube. And to learn more about growth marketing in general, visit advancedb2b.com. Cheers.